Hello ladies and gentlemen, in this video, concurrency and how it is controlled by managing transactions. We're going to look at what transactions are and what they help us do. Knowing that, we'll explain that concurrency problem. A transaction, think of a financial transaction. It's an exchange of information and in databases, transactions are something special because sometimes for a single transaction, you've got to do several things. For example, you might record that someone has given some money and also record that some product has been sent. And if you lose one or the other of these, then something's gone wrong with your transaction. You don't want the database to record one of those two things and somehow, because of some accident with your system, lose the other one. So we say that transactions are what we call ACID. ACID stands for four properties that are listed here. So they are atomic, consistent, isolated and durable. Let's look at what that means. So first of all, the transaction is atomic. It means you can't break up the transaction into several pieces. If several operations are bundled together in a transaction, either we'll do all of it or if something goes wrong, we'll do none of it. Second thing, the transaction is what we call consistent. The thing that is consistent is the database. The database, as the transaction starts, is in a consistent state where its rules are respect. Then all sorts of operations happen to save the data, record things correctly and the kind of things. When the transaction is midway through, there might be all sorts of things that are wrong about the recordings. But at the end of the transaction, the database is again in a consistent state. So if there is a rule that says that the total amount of stock for a product must always be a positive number, it might be that as we carry out some operations, the total amount of stock goes through a negative figure. But by the end, things which have gone back to normal, to a consistent state, and your stock is normal. The third property we've got in there is that transactions are what we call isolated. If you have several transactions, they shouldn't interfere with each other. They shouldn't uh, influence each other. That's especially important when two transactions are happening at the same time. You'll see more of that in the rest of this video. Finally, the last thing is that transactions should be durable. Once a transaction has been recorded, the recording is made safe. It's done through things like backups or this sort of things. Of course, it's possible that after some information has been recorded, there is a legitimate reason to change it. In a way, the point of databases is to keep data safe. Transaction safety, it's one of those things that IBM did its best to guarantee even before relational databases were available. All right, let's look at how some of these things are actually being organized. If your transaction is atomic, you want it to be a single logical unit of work. There's two possibilities. Either your transaction has gone just fine, in which case, at the end of this process, we say that it is committed. So here is our transaction number one. It carries out two operations and it finishes with a commit. At the commit, because the transaction has now ended, we make the changes permanent. But if something goes wrong, we'll say that the transaction is rolled back. Rolled back is an old name for undo, if you like. If you look at the instructions in there, let's say the transaction fails. Doesn't matter quite why. If the transaction fails, will give an instruction for it to roll back and it will be undone. Everything in it will be undone. Like that, either those two instructions in the transaction will both be enacted or neither of them will be. I didn't say what the two statements in this transaction do or why they might be a useful unit to have. Pause this video, Think about it for a few seconds. Why would they form a logical unit that you want to operate together? Have you paused the video yet? 
Right, solution. The two instructions are one, an order for a widget, and the number which is also being used for the stock later, it's ordering three of some widget. And that's added into a row in an order line table. And the second instruction decreases the amount of stock of the product for that widget. You can probably see why we want these two things to both happen or none of it to happen. If we are carrying out this order, then we want to actually remember the order and record it to be able to send the product. And we also want to be updating uh, the amount of stock and keep tabs on how much of the product we've still got available to sell. Which is why if something goes wrong while this transaction is running, you know, if we don't record the decrease in the amount of stock, then we don't want to record the order either. I didn't say anything about why failures in the transaction would happen, why rollbacks should happen. A lot of the time we just don't know. Why would a record in a database go wrong? A network failure? A slowdown in the server? Transactions are set up to run in a given time in case something goes wrong. It's said in advance that if it takes more than uh, five seconds to record this information, it can't be done. Something has gone wrong. Cancel it, just in case. And all sorts of unusual things, you know, hacking, uh, what the insurers call acts of God that cause our systems to go wrong. In any case, most of the time, we have to go with the idea that the transaction couldn't be recorded. We have no idea why the transaction couldn't be recorded. The important thing is that when that happens, we need to be able to recover. That is, we need to be able to step back and not record one half of the transaction while losing the other half. Okay. Now that you have an idea what a transaction is and how we organize transaction safety, time to talk about what happens when two people are using the database at the same time. Well, first of all, maybe two people don't use the database at the same time. If we want things to be simple, then we would organize our database to carry out the instructions that come to it serially, one after the other like cars in a single file. The problem with that is people expect speed from their database systems. Alternatively, you could do things concurrently. You have several processors, you have several servers, your information is being processed for several users at the same time. You can think about that like traffic going through multiple lanes. It's going to be quicker. So we have a serial schedule and we'll organize the way that our system processes the information either in a series or by interleaving access to the data. I'll answer user A a bit, then for user B a bit, for user C and so on. You've got to do some work to make sure that that doesn't go wrong. Uh, let's see. To understand the idea, I'm going to compare two transactions and we'll look when it is serial or not serial and so on. You've got two transactions and they are executed serially. So the first transaction runs some product is big ordered and then when diminish the stock and that's fine and when it's committed another transaction runs for maybe another customer their order is being recorded and the stock is counted again and that is committed and nothing's gone wrong there the first transaction ran the information was made safe the next transaction ran the other information was made safe as well fantastic then look at this other case which is also simple we're interleaving our two transactions. So they are both running at the same time. There isn't a user that will have to wait. Both transactions begin in turn, and then the first transaction picks up some data. The second one also picks up some data, the same data. Then we change a line in the order line table. We change another line in the order line table, but we've not changed the same lines. We've read some data. There's no problem with that information being accessed at the same time because we're not touching the same parts of the system. So both transactions commit and it's just fine. The funny thing is the small percentage of cases where you have two transactions that are running and both of them are trying to access the same data at the same time. One transaction may be changing data while at the same time the other transaction needs to read it. 
or else both transactions might be writing into the same data at the same time. To continue with my comparison with cars, you know, if you've got lots of cars running fast on parallel lanes, then things can go wrong sometimes. Let's see an example of a problem with concurrent scheduling. Two transactions begin at roughly the same time, and then both of them are going to change the value of some stock. First order starts off and is recorded in the underlying table. Second order is also in there. So far, so good. Then the machine updates the product value. Let's say the product starts at 100. The machine updates the product value for the first transaction. That gets to 97. But because the transaction is not made permanent until it's committed, that 97 is held temporarily until the commit. That means that the second transaction, which is isolated from the first, sees the old value of the stock. It carries out its calculation, it finds its value, 95. The first transaction is going to commit first. It commits, it stores its value, it's done its job, it's happy. Second transaction then commits and stores its value. Second transaction has, how can I word it, has won by arriving last. But that isn't the value we should have for the stock. Again, pause the video, think about it for a second. The stock started at 100. What should it be now? Answer, now. The value of the stock starts at 100. We take three away. We take 5 away, we get to 92. If the transactions had executed serially, one after the other, that's what we would have got, that's what it should have been. A non-serial schedule, a concurrent or interleaved schedule, should be producing the same results as a serial one. Sometimes people talk about this as race conditions. That is, you know, imagine you've got the two cars racing each other. The, the drivers have had the same training. They've got excellent technical teams. Which transaction is going to arrive first depends on some really small technical detail. The speed of a network. Those race conditions make it really difficult to control concurrency. If you have a system where many different users are accessing the same information at the same time, you don't know which transaction will be running before which. And the errors that you get in those conditions are very difficult to work out. Let's see how we can control concurrency. There are really two techniques. One is called locking and the other one is called timestamping. Basically locking is based on the idea that if one transaction is using some data, the other ones can't use that data at the same time. So it's like, you know, it's mine, you can't touch it. Time stamping works differently. When a transaction runs, it marks the data with information to be able to step back and get things right if some concurrency problem has damaged the data. I'll show you time stamping first because it's the simplest one to explain. But I'm not sure it's the simplest one to understand. We'll put a unique identifier to everything that happens to the database with the time in it. That's why we call it a timestamp. If there is a problem, if there is a conflict between two transactions, the transactions will be rolled back, restarted. The transaction that happens first will, be, will get the priority. We give a timestamp to, to transactions themselves, when they begin, when they end, and we give a timestamp to data item. When we read data, we mark it with a timestamp. When we write data, we mark it with a timestamp. In case of conflict, when we are writing or reading data, we compare timestamps and the request is permitted if there is no timestamp that indicates a conflict. Otherwise, the operation is denied and we roll back the transaction and restart it later with a new timestamp. Let's see an example of that. So if I take my same old data, each transaction begins First one inserts some data in all the line, and when we do, we put in a write timestamp, an indication of the time when this write is starting. Transaction two then starts inserting the data. 
but the timestamps indicate that the last update to this data is in progress. Because of that, the transaction is rolled back and it waits a bit. Meanwhile, transaction one finishes its job. It writes the product, it changes the value, it makes that permanent, it commits. Transaction one has now finished, transaction two has waited all this time. Transaction two rebegins, it has its timestamp, it has its insert into the order line and puts in the value of the stock. Oh, it's the wrong insert here. And that should say order two and that should say five, sorry. So that's uh, roughly how timestamping works and it protects the transaction by effectively, when there is no conflict, the transactions can happen at the same time. But if there is a potential conflict and one transaction is undone and then begun again later, avoiding the conflict, then the machine works at the correct value and at the end, it has worked as if serializations. Right, if we look at the other technique called locking, locking will cause the data to be unavailable for a transaction when it is available for an. You've got two kinds of locks. You can have a shared one. So when you're reading data, the lock will say, do not change this data, I'm reading it. And then you've got an exclusive lock. Don't even look at this data. I'm in the middle of changing it. I'll tell you when I finish. So those two locks are the way that we're going to control our transactions. Let's see again our two transactions in action with a lock this time. So we begin transaction one and two, we start inserting data. But when we're inserting data into the first thing, it will put in a lock on the order line table. The lock causes transaction two to not have access to the table. So transaction two is going to wait until eventually it unlocks. Right. Transaction two waits because the table is locked. Meanwhile, transaction one continues. It updates products with its lock. It commits. When transaction one commits, that releases the locks. The locks are released. Transaction two can go. It inserts its data into the order line table, into the product table, and we get to the right value. It commits as well. At the end, both transactions have run. We've got the correct value for the stock. We're happy once more. When there was a conflict, the two interleaved transactions suddenly waited for each other, bringing back a serial schedule. Um, locking happens in several phases. The trick is we don't want to lock too much data because if when a transaction runs, no one else can access any of the database, it's very wasteful. So the locks are acquired one bit at a time. The transaction begins, then there is a growing period when more and more locks are acquired on the data. So we lock all the line and then we lock product. Once the machine has finished acquiring more locks, on the commit it unlocks and then the locks are released at the end of this process. Like that, say another transaction wanted to access product while transaction one is accessing order line. That would be possible. We're going to have one problem with locking. It's a situation called a deadlock. The animation will make that clear. Two transactions begin in turn. The first one does its insert and so locks its data. Meanwhile, the second transaction carries out something else. Maybe the same operations in the reverse order. So it will first update product and then insert the order. Why not? Both tables are locked. Let's see. Transaction one now needs to update product, but it can't because it's waiting for transaction two. Meanwhile, transaction two is trying to insert the order. Oh, oh. It's what we call a deadlock. Each of the two transactions is waiting for the other one to finish and release its locks to be able to itself terminate and commit. Uh, that could be lasting a long time. So occasionally when you have an interleave schedule, there are conflicts. And occasionally when it is managed by locking, there is a deadlock. It doesn't happen too often, but the database systems need to get out of it when it does. So there's a couple of ways that we organize this. One is a timeout. There's a lot of database systems in practice that use that solution. 
a transaction should only last a certain amount of time. If we've been waiting for the transaction to complete for more than five seconds, then something's gone wrong. The transaction is then aborted, rolled back, and it will be restarted a bit later. And that is done even if no deadlock has taken place. That could be another reason why the, dead, the, the, uh, why the transaction has gone wrong. Um, another technique is something called deadlock prevention. Basically, the database management system is going to be programmed to spot if a deadlock is likely to happen beforehand. But that involves a lot of processing on the part of the computer system. And so a lot of systems don't use that technique. Timeouts are a lot simpler. The third technique is to detect the deadlock. When the deadlock situation occurs, to look at the timeout, how long the transaction has been going, but also how much of the data has been updated and how many data items remain to update still. For example, in this situation, when this deadlock is taking place, then neither transaction will update any data. This one is waiting. It's not change, making any change to any data. And that could last 10 minutes if you keep it waiting. Same thing with this one. So we could apply some deadlock detection that looks at, OK, how long has this transaction been going on for? And has it done anything in all that time? And if it's done nothing, then we know something is wrong. We would abort it and restart it. Two techniques for concurrency control then. If I compare timestamping and locking, which one is a better solution? In, uh, in timestamping, you don't have deadlocks because when there is a conflict, transactions are not carried through midway through. They are rolled back and then restarted a bit later. So that will avoid the deadlock in the, first, in the first place. That sounds good, but the problem with it is that every time information is read or written, every time a transaction starts, there has to be a record of this, which is an enormous amount of information to record. And that takes space on the systems and time to maintain. The other technique of locking, it's a more economical method because we don't need all of this recording. Um, but you get those, those deadlocks that require management. Locking is used more often in, in current systems. And there's also more opportunity to actually improve the management of deadlocks. So that's the ideas of a concurrency control. It's part of understanding under the hood how our systems are working. If you're working with databases, you can write queries correctly and get the right data without knowing this but it helps to understand what makes our database systems safe. And this is part of the work that the providers of our database systems do for us. Hope you found this interesting. Goodbye.